I wanted to say before I begun that we serve an amazing God, and He is worthy. Just I was also touched by the um, this by the song ministry this morning, and just He is a God who has shown us mercy. He's shown us grace. His Son has sacrificed all for us. Like He loves us even though we don't deserve Him. He is worthy of our praise, of our worship, of our lives. And our lives, between now and the time that we see him, ought to be dedicated and devoted to him. So, for those of you who don't know me, as Pastor already said, my name is Jeremy Zobel. My wife is also here, Rebecca. And we have um, our almost, let's see, nine and a half, nine and a half month old daughter, Harmony. She is not in the room right now. She's in the nursery. And that's good because if she was in the room, she'd be taking all the attention from me. <laughs> and I can't compete with her. So I'm glad she's down there. Um, but I'm sure you'll see her later on if you haven't already. Um, so yes, my name is Jeremy Zobel. I've been, I was a student at Maranatha. I graduated with my bachelor's in business in 2020. And um, I'm from Iowa originally. I met my wife, Rebecca, at Maranatha. And then the last couple of years, I've been serving on staff at the school there as well. But today, um, I've come back to this church of people that I, I really love. I love you all. I'm so glad that I, I have the privilege to be here. I really appreciate that Pastor Oman let me come. Um, I don't consider myself a special speaker, so I don't know who he's talking about. There's someone else who's coming, but I am not. I don't know. I'm just nobody. But here we are. Um, so we are starting a new ministry or helping start a new ministry in Utah. Um, and so, let's see here. Why Utah? Why in the world Utah? Are we going to go join the Mormons? No, that's, that's not the case either. <laughs> um, but yeah, why Utah? Like, how did, how did we get there? Because um, I don't really have any, didn't really have any connections in Utah, um, aside from this particular ministry. So I'll have to kind of give you some, some backstory here of how we got in connection with them. Um, there is a family who I've met uh, let's see, the Smith family. So they had a couple kids who, actually most of their kids have gone through Maranatha. Um, the Smiths have been missionary builders out in the West for 28, some 29 years or so. And it, recently God's been putting on their heart a burden to teach Christian young people the trades. There is a great deficit in young people going into the trades right now. Um, and so I met the two youngest siblings, Drew Smith and Caitlin Smith. Caitlin Smith was staying in Becca's wedding, so but they've been good friends um, at Maranatha. And Mike Smith, their dad, he's the one who is um, who is starting the ministry. Mike Smith um, was promoting at Calvary, and I just happened to be there during the missions conference. And I asked him, hey, what is it that you need to help start this ministry? Because he just was kind of posing the idea, this is what we're going to do. What is it that you need? What are the roles that you have left to fill? And so then he told me, he's like, well, we need someone um, to run the business. We need someone to do student life. We need someone to teach. We need someone to, like, he listed a lot of, like, all of the, all of the positions that a college would have. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> there's a lot of need there. Um, and they, at this point, they are, they have a board of trustees. They have a, a board of trustees who's helping run the, run the school. And they have a few people who are volunteering their time part-time. But at this point, they're the only family who are working full-time in this ministry. And God kind of put it on my heart. This is, this is something I should pursue. It's something I should look into. Um, he had put it on my heart at, the, at that time that Maranatha, wow, is a wonderful university. I love my time there. It was not the place that God had for us to, to invest the rest of our lives into. So where to? Where to then? Um, so when Legacy came up as an option, we took a survey trip in December of this last year to go down. We took like five or six days down there just to meet people, just to see what they had so far. And God opened the doors. He made it very clear, this is where I want you to go. He's prepared you to go and do this. And I'm going to go down there and, and be the director of business and development to help run the business side of it. Because Mike's, Mike himself is not a businessman. He is a tradesman. By trade. <laughs> He's a tradesman. He doesn't know business as well. And so I'm hoping with what little experience I've gotten so far, hopefully together we can, you know, take this off. Uh, wrong way. So that was during our survey trip down there. Um, Mike Smith is the guy right next to me in the corner and his wife is right behind him. And then there are two other young men in the background there. Those are two students who started, they, they did a soft start this last school year, a soft start with two students just to kind of see what do they need, what are the, the financial needs that they'll have, just to kind of get an idea of what this looks like. And they're hoping to start fully in this fall. So the two students there are um, Robert and Judah. And then, of course, there's Harmony there, and them, you know, being adorable. Uh, so how did Legacy start? Um, 
how did Mike get started with Legacy? Um, as I mentioned before, he's been passionate about young men going into the trades because there's a great deficit of young people going into the trades. Both secularly, I mean, not just Christians, but as a whole, America needs people in the trades. Um, for a while now, a bachelor's degree has been kind of has kind of become the new high school diploma. Like everyone, you just are expected to go to college. What are you doing? You're not going to college. What are you doing? Why aren't you going to college? Like, it's just kind of been the, the norm. Everyone needs, just needs to go to college. But we need people in the trades. We need carpenters. We need plumbers. We need electricians. And there's so many different skills that are out there. And they pay well, too. It's not even that, oh, if you go to one of those other jobs, it's kind of a lower class. You don't get paid as much. No, they, they do pay well. Um, and there's a great need for them. Um, so skilled labor is in decline. Um, and skilled labor with a Christ-like servant training is also very needed. Um, who's going to fill the need? What's the need? Um, we need people in the in the construct in the trades environment, um, Christians who are project managers, who are contractors, skilled labor, welding, structure framing. Um, let's see, go to the next slide here. And then within the church as well, um, we need people who are going into the ministry as well, especially out west. Mike has been living in west his whole life. And there's a lot of churches out there who are lacking Sunday school teachers, who are lacking pastors, who are lacking deacons. Um, and there is there is need both for Christian ministry as well as need for the trades. So then Legacy is hoping to combine the two, teach people the trades while also giving them Bible training as well. Think about um, there's a lot of churches out there who need a pastor, but they can't afford a full-time pastor. So if someone got the Bible training to become a pastor, but also had the trade skills to be able to do trade on the side to earn money, that would fill the gap, and they would then be able to pastor at a church that doesn't have the financial support, right? Uh, we need faithful young men and women in the church as well who, whether they're in the trades or, when, or any other skills, they need to be faithful and have Bible training. That, that's a need all across the board. We need more, more young people doing that. Um, the harvest is truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Matthew 9, 37. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Showing to the generation to come the praise of the Lord, his strength, and his wonderful works that he has done. We need faithful young people in the church. Around us, there are a lot of young people who are starting to leave the faith, and we're hoping to be a a rock that people can come to and build their foundation upon Christ, helping young people to see that that Christ, again, what we just talked about, Christ is worthy, and he is worthy of your life. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And ultimately, as we're teaching young people, we don't want these young people just to be... Um, means unto themselves, but to go out and be disciple makers, to go help and preach to other others, to, to be mentors for other young people, to multiply. That's what Mike really hit, was that there was such a need out west that he and his family and other missionary builders who are out there aren't able to supply the need. So what do you do? You can't multiply. I mean, you can't, you can't, do, you can't be in more than one place at once. What do you do? You have to, in a sense, multiply yourself, teach others who can do the work, and teach them to teach others who will teach others, who will teach others. And that's how you can get a wide, broad, you know, impact onto this country. So as I kind of talked about, that's what Legacy Trade College is all about. Uh, at this point, can we switch over to the video? We've got a quick three-minute video. Here we go. I'm just going to step down here. And hopefully we... Do we have sound? Of our mission is yeah. to provide industrial arts and liberal arts at the same time, both Bible, healthy environment, and industrial arts, construction, things like that at the same time. But our mission would be for someone that is gifted in those talents to realize or understand that God has given those talents and that that.
husband who's been living it for 30 years. When I heard about Legacy, I was like, well, okay, Christian trade school. I would love to come to a Christian trade school and learn how to do trades and get a bio degree. I like the Christian environment around the job site. Um, there's a lot less cursing and swearing and stuff. As we work here, we're able to apply um, construction ideas to Christianity and vice versa. Building a solid foundation was our first first day here. My philosophy of Christians in the trades is that when we do work, we do work for God's glory, not compartmentalizing our lives on Sunday and then Monday through Friday being a different person. Many pastors push Bible college to their young people, to their, their own family members, as well as young people in their church. And I think that's good. Many students, however, are not cut out for Bible college or a, a liberal arts training. Many students are gifted by God in the area of working with their hands. The trades are important because they're necessary. We, we need these kind of things. I've just been able to use this as a means of ministry to help people. When you have a desire to serve the Lord, you want to do your best and you want to use every ability that you have and all of the strength that you have and everything that God gives you. A lot of different avenues of learning for each student so they can customize it to exactly the calling God has placed on their lives. The Bible says every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. And not only does it say that, it says we are to use our gifts or our abilities or talents for the glory of God. Probably the thing that I tell the parents the most that are interested in legacy would be now you don't have to choose. Now you don't have to force your kid to go to Bible college or trade college. You don't have to choose between the two because we're both. That's the main reason that students are coming is because they don't have to choose between the world and the ministry. Okay, so um, a couple more things about where Legacy is at at this point. Um, so going back to the question of why Utah, why did they start in Utah, and specifically where is Legacy Trade College at? I think the next slide should be, there it is. So Legacy Trade College, we are located in Marysvale, Utah. And a couple facts about it, there's a population in this town of 440 people. The elevation is just under 6,000 feet, and it's located in the second least populous county in the state with 1,400 residents. Now, I've got a small town that I'm from in Iowa, and it has 3,000 people. This is a small town. The whole county has 1,400 people. Why in the world are we there in Marysville? Not to mention it's also three hours from the nearest airport. Why is it there? <laughs> um, so the older gentleman you saw in the video there, um, John Ennis, he was the man who donated the facilities for Mike to start this whole dream of his, right? Um, Mike hasn't had the funds to, like, it, take, it takes a lot of uh, money to start a college, right? You can't just, like, you need money to start it, right? And John Ennis has been living in Marysville for most of his life. He's actually from Wisconsin himself, from Kenosha, but he's been living in Marysville for most of his life. Um, he's had an addictions ministry called Christian Vocational Ministries that help um, men and women who were addicted to get off of smoking, get off of drugs, get off of alcohol, etc., and in the meantime, teaching them the trades. Um, he's getting too old to continue that ministry himself, and so he asked Mike, hey, do you want to continue on this ministry? And Mike's like, well, I don't have a heart necessarily for that ministry, but here's my idea, which is teaching young people the trades, and John is like, oh, sure, use that. And so he actually gifted all the facilities that he has. There's two buildings there. There's about like three or four acres on the actual property. There's two buildings with woodworking, with um, welding facilities there that he's just been totally donated to Legacy. And so that's why we're starting at Marysville. There's not a lot of space. We could probably have about 20 to 25 students this first start, this first year. And our goal is that this, we've always seen this as kind of we. Mike's always seen this as, this is a great place to birth this baby. We're going to start here, and as God provides, we're going to move to a larger city, move to a bigger place where we can grow. Um, 
But being in a remote area has some pros in itself in that the young men and women have more opportunity just to um, be with God and not have so many distractions of the, of the world around you. We are located in some beautiful mountains. It is gorgeous out there. Um, the nearest town is about, uh, the nearest like city that has like a Walmart and whatnot is about a half hour away, but you have to drive through this beautiful valley. And I'm like, uh, when my wife and I were, were visiting, like, yeah, we could get used to this. This is, this is really in the middle of nowhere, but it's really beautiful out there. Um, so that's kind of why they started there in Marysvale, Utah. Uh, some other pictures of it. That's the city down there in the valley. Um, you've got mountain ranges on either side of it, and it, there's a couple towns just kind of in the middle of the valley there. Here's some pictures of the actual workshops itself. Um, the building is comprised of, um, it was a, the actual facilities that we have originally were the depot and kind of business building for Marysville back when it was a mining town. They had gold, they had silver, um, uranium, and the business building is kind of developed, is kind of separated into eight different bays, you could say eight different rooms, and three of the rooms are dedicated towards woodworking. One of them is a garage, and the other four are kind of living, eating, dormitory, that kind of space. And then the depot itself, it's a smaller building, but that's kind of more of a dorm space as well on the side. So there's the main building, that's the one that has the eight different bays. And then behind it, there's a white building, which I think the next picture should have a better view. Yeah, this is the depot. Um, the, the, the tracks are long gone. This has been, um, it was a long time ago they were pulled. And there's kind of the campus that you can see for itself. There's the two buildings, um, the one up front there and the white one in the back. So there's not a lot of space. This is, this is kind of small. And here's the backside as well. Part of the depot is um, uh, the depot, the white building there, is, is put into kind of a barn as well. So we could, in theory, um, get some animals in there. And a lot of um, one of Mike's goals is eventually to have some um, animal husbandry care. Like, how would you take care of animals? Have that on the side as well. Um, okay, some other facts. So one, another reason why that I heard about this is that Legacy is partnering with Maranatha to provide the Bible classes at this time. They are considered a bridge to campus location, which means that the students there at Legacy can zoom in to the Bible classes that are occurring at Maranatha. Um, at this point, we don't have any full-time Bible faculty who are there on the campus. And until then, we're going to be using Maranatha as a means to supply the Bible training while Legacy then su supplies the, um, the trades, right? Um, John and Mary Lou Innes were the ones who donated the, the property. There's a board of directors with um, five different people on it. And they're kind of scattered all throughout the nation. Um, some of them are close, others are down in Georgia. But the board of the board of directors are have a wide skill base. Some of them are pastors, some are accountants. One guy is a lawyer. That's really helped to bring in the skills that we need to get this thing off the road, uh, off the ground. Um, and then there's a church in town, Marysville Baptist Church, and the pastor of it is Pastor Richard Boyle. Um, I don't know if um, I know we've had. Uh, I'm good friends with Alex and Nicole Boyle. They were students at Maranatha as well. I don't know if they've come through this church in the past. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Um, and at this point, we do have a lot of prayers, but God is answering prayer. Um, they had, again, they had two students for this first start of year. They've had a lot of different work teams come down and help um, construct and make sure the facilities are suitable for, for college, right? Um, my church in, in Hartford has actually done that as well. They sent down a work team last summer to help and to get things ready, get the dorms ready. Um, but how can you all help? This is where I talk about, like, what are the needs that we're facing right now? Um, the biggest one that I would really want to ask for is prayer support. God's not, God is going to move when people ask him in prayer. We need a lot of people praying for us. We need a lot of people um, supporting us in prayer. And God does answer prayer. Um, the biggest thing that to pray for right now is that the state of Utah would accept our paperwork for us to be officially considered a college. You have to go through the Consumer Protection Agency and the state of Utah to get your papers in line to actually be considered a college. And until we do that, we can't put the name out in front of the building that we are a college. We can't take official applications in. Um, the return, it should come back any week now. We're hoping to have it by um, by middle of May, 
Um, but that's been a big prayer request. We sent in the paperwork about three or four weeks ago, and it's just a lengthy process. We're just waiting to hear back from this point. But this is a big piece. Without that piece, we can't go, we can't call ourselves a college. Um, Furnace of the main building, I should have updated that. Furnace of the main building, we had one church who donated $5,000 for that, so that, that has been covered. Um, curriculum development, that's what a lot of the people on the board of directors are working on right now. Um, we have a couple different people. Um, one man who's in Colorado who's been, who is certified for all the different levels of welding, and he's really working on the different curriculum. He has a master's in education. He's been putting that together. He's on the board. Um, but he right now is living in, in um, Colorado. So uh, while he's working on the curriculum, we would really love to have someone who is there in person this coming school year um, to, to teach the welding on a day-to-day -day basis. He's going to come in every, he's going to come in for two to three weeks each semester to really check off the guy's certifications, but we do need someone there on a regular basis to do welding. Um, students for the opening of school in 2024, that's a big prayer request. We have a lot of students who are interested, even as I'm talking with students um, at Maranatha, um, or um, as I'm going out there and meeting different students, I'm hearing a lot of people who are interested in the trades. So the biggest prayer, like even bigger than students coming, is just that we'd have the faculty and staff to come in. We have people who are working part-time, volunteering their time, but we really, it would really be beneficial to have people who'd step out in faith and come and teach carpentry, come and teach electri electri electrical, all those things, plumbing. Um, Financial support, um, I've had people ask me, hey, are you guys going on deputation? Are you asking for support for yourself? And I'm saying, no, God's providing for us. But I would ask um, that if you do want to give, give towards the school, because the, the salary that the school is agreed to pay us is only contingent upon them having the money to pay us. So, so pray that we have the students come in, as well as if you want to give, you can give to Legacy. We have the business cards in the back. You can go to the website and do that. Um, business plan, that's what I'll be working on. They've already have some things together, but when I come in, uh, May, uh, let's see here, like the third or fourth week of May is when I'll be starting. We'll, we are moving down there starting May 16th, so almost uh, just over a month we'll be down there, and that's one of the first things I'll be working on is a business plan. And then, of course, I mentioned already staff and faculty as well. And again, the goal is to start in fall of 2024. Any questions? At this point, I'll open it up for anyone who has questions. Yeah, Isaac. Will you be living on campus, or will you have a place to plan? Yes, that's a good question. So when we went down and visited, one of the things we wanted to look at is, okay, what does it look like for living conditions? And, you know, housing's pretty expensive up here, right? <laughs> you think it's bad here? <laughs> it's really bad down there. Um, there is one house I saw for sale in the city, and... Uh, I think like the whole property was maybe like a lot, maybe as big as this room. And you have, it's like a, it's like a one bedroom starter home, you know, tiny, tiny house. And it was going for $396,000. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we're not going to get a house when you go down there. We just won't have the money for that. But there are living, uh, there's an apartment on the campus itself where the Mike, uh, where the, where Mike Smith and his family are currently living. They bought a house this last year and had been working on rebuilding it. And they, Lord willing, will be able to move into it by the end of the summer. So we'll be living in, in their apartment at the end of the summer. And until then, we'll be living in the depot, which think of the depot as like, um, it's kind of laid out like you would have a cabin for um, a camp where you've got one room, a bunch of bunks, you've got one room for like the cabin leader, a kitchen and other stuff. It, it's fully, fully furnished. It's not a huge apartment, but it'll be, it'll be enough for what we need until we move into their apartment. And then as as we need more space, God will provide, I'm sure. I don't know how he will yet, but I know he will. So, what other questions? I, I wish that this was an opportunity I had when I was in school. Yeah. You know, and, and you're, they're, they're correct. They're, they're, the trades are, all the people who do trades right now are retired. Yes. And there's nobody to replace them. Yes. And this is a great, fantastic idea. all the time and they're all like yeah we're gonna go to we're gonna go to hvac we're gonna go well we're gonna go do because that's where the money is right now mm -hmm. that's what we need right now mm -hmm. so it this is. is a fantastic idea yeah 
Um, it was estimated, and I don't know what the numbers were updated for this year or not, but a couple years ago it was estimated for 2024 that there would be about 400,000 400, jobs that are open in the trades, welding, carpentry. Like there's such a such a need. And as more people retire, as you said, there's more and more of a need. And it's, it's good work too. Like God has designed us to work and has given us a, a satisfaction when we see a job well done. Um, that's something that I'm, the last couple of years I've been doing a desk job. And I've kind of wished, like, you know what? I really wish I was doing more stuff with my hands. Now, I'm not a tradesman myself, um, but I would love to learn along with the guys while I'm down there. Um, and God has given us all different skills. Some of us are not, you know, are not mathematicians. Others aren't great at writing papers. We're not, not all of us are academic, so to say. But some of us are a lot better at working with our hands. Does that make you a, a second-class citizen? Not by any means. God has given us different skills. Let's use them. I have another question, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, are you planning, as, as the business director, are you planning on teaming up with some businesses to, you know, factories and stuff? Yep. To, like, you know, bring somebody in as an apprentice? Yes. And then they can go where the business will pay for them to go to school? Yep. That's actually part, it's already, for the two students who are there right now, they have actually already are doing that. But there's a construction building, a construction company in town where the students at this point are spending half their time at Legacy and the other half of the time they're working for a company right now. They're getting real life experience out there. Same thing for welding. That'll be what we'll do. We'll have them go to Richfield or the nearest area where they can actually do welding on the job site. So what it'll look like in the end is we'll half the time actually working with the faculty, learning on that side, and the other half the time we'll be in the workplace learning on that side, which I also think is going to be tremendous for the spiritual side of it, that as we're teaching them how to live for Christ, we're putting them into an environment where the rubber's going to meet the road, right? At Maranatha, for example, we're in a bubble, and it's very easy to, to, to live for Christ, so to say, when everyone else around you is doing it. But when you're out there in the world, in the workplace, all of a sudden you're tested, and it's hard. But that's, it's good to do it then. It's really good to do it while, while they're still in, a, in, in a, an environment where they can go ask for help, go ask the faculty and staff for help. Hey, I'm in this situation. I need help here. What does God say about this? So... Um, working in a secular workplace is going to be part of it. And it gives them job experience. Are they going to offer apprenticeships through the, through the school? Are they going to offer apprenticeships for those who are already in the workplace? Yes. Yep. And then, okay. Yep, they will. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mrs. Franklin. <laughs> um, do you, how, how many potential students do you have lined up for fall? We've got some pre-applications in. I have not, I've, it's hard to say because I'm not there in person. I'm not actually, it's, I'm, I'm recruiting at churches while, while I'm still at Maranatha. So it's like, I'm not staffed there yet to know. I've asked Mike and we've got, we've got about 20, 30, 40 some students who are interested. Some of them have actually put in a pre-application, but it's not an official application. We won't have any like real numbers until we get the state approval. And that's the big thing we're waiting on. Um, and really, I feel like, I feel like we'll be able to get, <coughs> about 15 or 20 students this first year, which we don't have a lot more space to do more than 30. I mean, more than, yeah, more than 30. Uh, there's another ministry in town that has a industrial sized kitchen and other um, kind of dormitory space that if we need to, we could overflow into that. That's a whole other story in itself. But so there is room that we could really grow into, um, but we're looking at kind of 15 to 20 this first year. Yeah, hope. Mm -hmm. that's a that's a great question so it depends on what the student is looking for um, if they are just looking for certain certifications I'm like some kind of like lower certifications you're looking at one to two years um, but we do require all the students to take Bible classes and these are college level Bible classes there's gonna be a lot of students who also while getting their certifications they want to get an associates and through, through the classes that are offered Maranatha and Legacy. And if they want to get an actual diploma, because they can get that as well, you're looking at three to four to five years. If they want a full, they want a full bachelor's um, through the classes that offered through Maranatha and Legacy, they're looking at, you're looking at about four to five years if you're looking for bachelor's, associates, two to three, and then just for the certifications. Probably, I don't think... I don't have it all worked out yet, and that's what they're working on right now. I, I think for the most part, there wouldn't be anything less than two years. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't recall, but Go ahead. That, um, how much, I don't know if you 
we know this yet, but how much approximately is tuition for each year? Yeah, great question. They're aiming for about $10,000 per school semester, so we'll be looking at $20,000. Now, because we are partnered through Maranatha at this point, Maranatha is an accredited school, and they can take Pell. They can take federal financial aid, so that's really going to cut down a lot of that. So that's on no financial aid, $10,000 per semester. With it, you're looking at you know, five to six thousand per semester. So that's going to help a lot. Any other questions as well? There's a lot of scholarships out there as well for young people going into the trades because there's such a need for it. A lot of external scholarships, right? Third-party scholarships. So there's a lot of different options we can refer our students to to get money for, for that. Yeah. What about after uh, completion? I don't have all the details for after completion. Um, they're going to be, depending on what they want to go for, like um, they can get, like if you're going to welding, for example, there's different certifications you can get for welding, different types of metals. Um, the one guy who's who's doing the training, um, he's certified all the way up through platinum. If you, have, if you have a student who wants to do that, you can, you can go all the way up there and do that. Um, as far as, are you saying like a placement test that they have to take at the end, or are no, you saying? Placement for, you know, job. Oh, yeah. Um, the, we'd have a lot of connections. We have a lot of connections currently with the different businesses in that area. Richfield is about 30 minutes away. Um, and then it, we're going to be really encouraging the students at their home place to be getting internships there over the summer. Internships are huge because not only do they give you more life experience, but they give you connections as well. So really encouraging them over the summer to be getting internships. And that's where you're going to get your placements into jobs is getting the internships. They see, oh, you've got the skills. Come on in. Yeah. Anything else? If you do have more questions, I have my business cards on the back table there as well. We also have a prayer letter sign up sheet. You can write your email down there as well your first name, last name, email. Um, there's other giveaways there. So please, everyone should walk away with at least something from over there. There's pens, there's stickers, there's carpenter pencils. Take them from over there. It's all free. That's what it's there for. So um, I'm going to go ahead and transition then into the message. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to keep this pretty brief. Turn your Bibles with me to James. James chapter 1. And before we begin, I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that you have, um, as I said earlier, Lord, you are worthy. You've shown us mercy, you've shown us grace, and we don't deserve that. Um, Lord, I pray that our lives would, uh, would, be in, would be in response to what you have done for us, that everything that we do would be for your glory, that we'd be striving to serve you so that when we see you in glory, we would not be ashamed that when we see you in glory, you would see us as a faithful servant. Be with me today, word, Lord. Give me the words to say, and I thank you for, again, your love. In your name, amen. This last semester, I've been really studying out and kind of burdened about um, how to say it. Um, There are some times that we will say things, and we perfectly believe that to be the case about ourselves, but that's not the case. Like, our words are not always the truth about ourselves. Um, what I mean by that um, is that we can be deceiving of ourselves in our words. Um, so go to James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. Verses 22 through 24. And here he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Um, today I want to consider briefly, what does it look like to be someone who is a hearer of the word, but not a doer? Someone who, who knows who God is, who, 
who maybe even reads their Bible on a regular basis, but upon reading God's word, continues their life without ever being impacted by it, without ever making any, any, making any changes at all. And sadly, the American church today is filled with people of this nature, people who say that they love God and who are faithful servants to him, but their lives do not reflect it. So what does this look like? Two points then on, on, the, person, on the Christian who hears and does not, who does not act. So point number one, the Christian who hears, who hears God's word and doesn't act, they are a liar. We see in 1 John, that's just a book over, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that say, if he abideth in him, ought also himself to walk, even as he walked. And I guess as I said, the American church is full of these individuals who say, oh, I know him. Like, we can go out on the street witnessing and asking people, oh, do you know God? Are you, are you a believer? Oh, yeah, I know him. I pray every day. Right? We hear that all the time. But do you keep, their, do you keep his commandments? Do you do as he says you ought to do? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. If we say that we are followers of Christ but don't follow his actual commandments, we are a liar. And worse still, we're even deceiving ourselves. In verse 22, it talks, it talks about, and be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Not only do you deceive the people around you in that sense, but you're deceiving yourselves. Did you know it's possible to lie to yourself to the point that you believe the lie? That's the case for a lot of people in this world. A lot of people believe that they're going to go to heaven, but maybe it's because of their works, maybe because they think that they have done something, or that just because, oh, I pray to him on a regular basis. But their words aren't actual truth, and they've deceived themselves. We look at Ananas and Sapphira, um, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. They are individuals who, um, at that time, the church, a lot of the individuals were selling of what they had, and they had purpose in their hearts to lie to the church of what they had. Um, and God knows. The Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that they were not living as they said they were, and we all know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They died on the spot. Like God takes that seriously. Do we take that seriously with our own lives? Are we, when we study God's word, do we study it just so we can check something off on our list? Or do we study it so that we can be moved by God, so that we'd have a tender heart to see, to hear, and to then do, to hear, and to then act on it? Point number two, the Christian who hears and doesn't act has dead faith. We see in chapter number two, uh, chapter two of James, um, James talks about, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith but have not works, can faith say him? And he goes through this whole passage and he talks about um, that the faithism is a means for those around us to see the God who we believe in. And that faith without works is dead. He's not saying that you have to work, you have to do something, you have to serve God to be saved, because there's no way we can earn our salvation, we all know that. The sacrifice has already been made. Christ has already died on the cross. Our sins are paid in full. We don't want to get the, the horse in front of the cart, so to say. But our faith, our faith ought to result in action. As I said earlier, he is worthy. What were we just thinking about this whole morning? That, this morning, he is merciful. He has shown us grace. He has given us all. Ought we not to then give our lives in response to that? That is, the, that is the action that as we see, as we hear, as we sing about his word, are we doers as well? Or do we just say it but not do? Is our faith alive? John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, if you have faith in me, keep my commandments. Faith results in in action. It's not action so that I can be saved. It's not action so that I, I might believe. It's our faith results in action. Hebrews 11, we see all these individuals who, what do they do? By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch pleased God. By faith, Noah constructed. By, by faith, Sarah considered. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings upon his sons. By faith, action. Is your faith today resulting 
in action? Or is it a dead faith? Do you come into church on Sundays to let your you know, spirit be tickled and then not let it do anything to you throughout the rest of the week? Because America is filled with Christians who say they're Christians, and unfortunately, they are deluding what a Christian looks like. And so many people get the wrong impression of what a Christian looks like because there are so many people, most of America would say that they know God. Most of America would say that. A lot of people in church would say they know that. But does their life reflect their faith? The Christian who does not do this is inconsistent. And I don't mean that a Christian who, who, does, who, is not, who is a hearer of the word but not a doer is inconsistent. And I don't mean inconsistent as in, um, you know, two days out of the week he's consistent, two days not. It's inconsistent as in it doesn't add up. It's like two plus two equals three. Someone who is saved, their life ought to then reflect. Someone who has faith in God, who recognizes the weight of their sin that has been forgiven, ought to then turn around and serve Christ with their life. It is their reasonable service. We see that in Romans 12. What else should I do after I've been given this amazing gift but dedicate my life for him? He is worthy of you. Do you have faith and do you recognize that that's what your life ought to look like? And again, again, it's not that you serve so that you could be saved. You could never earn your salvation. But, oh, I want to serve God because he's given me everything. So what does that look like? What does it look like to serve God? And again, I'm going over. I'll, be, <laughs> I'll try to wrap this up. What does it look like? Well, we need to follow his commandments. In Mark chapter 12, we see him, the disciples ask him, well, what are the two greatest commandments? And he says to love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your might, all your heart, all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is namely this, love your neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So let's just start with these two. Do you love the Lord your God with all that you are? And again, we'd all, like, our default answer would be, yes, of course I do. But as I said, do our words actually reflect our life? Because sometimes they don't. If you're to ask me, do you love God? Yes. But how much time do you spend studying his word? How much time do you spend getting to know him? How much time do you spend passion and burden about the lost souls who are around you? Because if you love God, you ought to love those who are around you. That's what the next part of the verse says. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Christ is burdened over the lost souls who are all around us. There are so many. Are you burdened over that? If that's not the case for you, I'm not saying that's not the fact that you aren't a Christian, but I am saying that if that's not the case for you, then go seek God in prayer. Go get to know him more. Let his heart become so much like yours, uh, your heart so much like his, that you are on fire for the fact that there are sinners just down the block, who are going to hell. And they've never been told. The harvest is plenteous, but we just have to go out there and bring in the harvest. And we think of all these other excuses why, oh, I, I, I don't, I might offend them, oh, it's going to be awkward. But you're living for yourself if you say that. Are we living for Christ or are you living for yourself? Do you love the world or do you love God? Because so many of us don't recognize how much we love the world. It's in our nature to love things that are shiny, in our nature to love things that, that go fast, that have a nice big house, to all these things. The American dream is to have and have, get, get, and then have it all, and you'll be happy. But no. As pastors just talking about, our life is going to culminate not with, you know, when you're at the altar with someone you're going to marry, not when you graduate, not when you have your retirement, not when you have this house. It's going to culminate when you're in front of the throne of God and you, he sees what you've done for him. Because only what is done for eternity is going to last. Everything else is going to burn. Do our lives reflect that? We say that we love God. We say that we serve him. But do our lives reflect it? When you look at God's word, it's a mirror. Is it hard to read God's word because we don't like the sea? What's on the other side? Verse 23 of James chapter 1. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Are we going to go home this afternoon and forget what God has done for us? Are we going to start Monday out and forget about his daily mercies? 
Are we going to forget about the fact that my coworkers are lost and need him? It's a continual battle. It's not just like that. you make the decision right now. No, it's a daily, it's an hourly. Lord, let me help me to follow you. Let my life reflect yours so that when I look in the mirror, so that when you see me, when I come in the glory, you can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I ask you today, where is your focus? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. You can look at your heart. You can examine yourselves and see, where is my focus? If you love me, keep my commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. There are, again, so many different things that we can get our minds focused on. We can get our minds focused on the world. We can get our minds focused on, on serving myself on what I want to do. But Christ asked us to live for him. If you truly believe that he has died for your sins, that he has given everything for you, it is only reasonable to give everything back in return. Is that the case for your lives today? I'm not the person who can see that. I can't judge you. I'm not that person. That's going to be between you and God. And he is the judge who can see every single bit of your life that not, not even your spouse sees. He knows everything, and everything's going to be revealed on that day. If Jesus was to ask you today, do you love me, what would you say? He would say to you, keep my commandments. This is my, my, last, my last thought here. Peter was an example of an inconsistent Christian where he said, Lord, I will follow you all the way to the end, low in, even into death, I will follow you. That's what he said. That was his words. But did his life reflect it? No. He truly believed it even. But did his life reflect it? When the time came that he was tested, he ran away and then denied him three times and the rooster crowed. And what did Jesus do afterwards when he came back, when he resurrected from the dead? Peter, head down in shame, he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus said, and Peter said, yes, Lord. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then he asked again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, Lord, I do. Then feed my sheep. And the third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter at this point is breaking down. Lord, of course, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Keep my commandments. Witness to those who are around you. Serve me. If you love Christ, keep his commandments. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is revealing. It is a sharp two-edged sword. And I pray, Lord, that you would let it be um, convicting and powerful in my life. There are still areas, Lord, I'm working on. None of us are perfect, but Lord, I pray that you continue to make me more into your image, that tomorrow, that, that today would be better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. That as I grow, I would understand and appreciate your mercy and your grace and just fall in love with you more and more every day. Lord, you are a great and amazing God and worthy of all that I am. I thank you. Lord, help us to love you more. I ask these things in your name, amen. Yeah. Our heads are bowed just for a moment. I know we're, we're getting late here, but I do want to give opportunity for those. Maybe the Lord has been working in your heart uh, through the, uh, the ministry that was presented today and also the opening of God's word. And so I want to just give the piano player uh, an opportunity to play just one verse um, uh, by way of invitation and give you an opportunity if the Lord is working in your heart this morning uh, maybe as a believer as we were reminded today who is, speaks and verbalizes uh, their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ but uh, maybe is lacking in the doing hearing the word but not doing maybe the Lord is working in your heart today in that way or maybe today uh, through the song service and through the preaching of God's word you would you would realize and recognize that that you've never entered into that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you don't know him as your Savior. 
So I'm going to ask the piano player just to play a verse today of an invitation song and uh, give, while she's playing, an opportunity while you sit there in your seat to, uh, to respond to the message that we heard today. So to go ahead and play just a verse and give those an opportunity who uh, maybe want to take the, uh, uh, this moment uh, to respond to the Lord working in their heart. <laughs> 